This morning we are taking a break from Galatians. And I want us this morning to think about our wonderful Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to think about his great love and his great mercy, his great compassion, his great care towards us, and the fact that he's not angry with any of us. You know, when you see the Roman Catholic Church and you see the crucifixes all around and you see an image of who they say is Jesus on the cross, that represents an angry Jesus. And you say, well, why would you say that? Well, when you attend a Roman Catholic funeral and you read the prayer cards where they are begging Mary to intercede with her son to not, not, not be angry with us, they believe in an angry God. Well, God's anger will be seen one day, but not today. And I want us to focus on his great love for us this morning. You know, the Bible tells us when Jesus came and entered his ministry in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And folks, I want you to understand we are still in the acceptable year of the Lord. All who will come to him, he will receive and he will never cast you out. Isn't that a blessed truth? Haven't you ever thought sometimes you deserve to be cast out? Sometimes when you do one of those things that you come away with saying, now why would I do something like that? Why would I say that? Why would I act this way? Why would I be drawn back into that type of sin again? He'll never cast you out. You're his. And I want us to look this morning in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35, down to the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as, having, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I want us to really see, first of all, when we think about the compassion of our Lord, his compassion for the suffering. And I want you to think about these suffering people. In this chapter, we see six instances where Jesus moved with compassion and ministered to those people in the midst of their suffering. If you look back in verse 2 through 7 of chapter 9, and notice it says, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. But And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think you evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. Well, this is a familiar story where the friends brought their, their friend who was sick of the palsy, who was unable to walk. 
And they brought him on a, on a pallet, on a blanket, a bed to, to see Jesus, couldn't get in. And they ended up having to climb up on top of the roof and open the top of the roof and lower their friend down, all for the purpose of having him see Jesus and to be healed by Jesus. Now, Jesus could have said, as he saw the man coming down, he could have said, this is highly irregular for any type of service. And we're not going to do that. We need to have our ushers remove this man. And there, we need to uh, you know, go along with the proper protocol of how we conduct a service. No, he reached out to this man and he, and he healed him. Listen, Jesus is a great savior of compassion, is he not? It didn't matter how sick the man was. It didn't matter how it destroyed the guy's roof. What mattered was that there was a person who was in need. Look, if you would, down to verse 18 of the same chapter. And notice, and while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshiped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. But notice in verse 20, and behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give, give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the, women were, when, when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. Well, what an interesting thing this is. Jesus is coming along, and the man Jairus comes and says, Please come and, and heal my daughter. She's very, very sick. And so as they begin their journey to his house, what happens? A woman comes and touches him. And Jesus stops his journey to Jairus' house, and he turns and he heals this woman. And by the time he got to Jairus' house, his daughter had already died. But what do we find about our compassionate Savior? He cares about the suffering, doesn't he? He saw the heartbrokenness of Jairus and his family, and he knew what he was going to do all along, did he not? And he raised this little girl back to life. We have a compassionate Savior. Yes. Think of verse 27. Notice here what it says in verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And he was come to the house. The blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And then, he then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. Well, he, he stops to heal two blind men. You see, all these things are happening on the same day. As he's making his way through the city, all of these things are happening. People are stopping him. People are coming to him. He's, he's observing things that are going on, and his heart is broken for them. Notice, if you would, down a little further in verse 32. And notice what it says here. And as, and as they went out, behold, they brought it to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake and the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never so seen in Israel. Well, here's a man who couldn't speak and he is possessed with a devil. And Jesus cast him out. And the crowds marvel because this was really a sign of the Messiah. That only the Messiah would be able to cast a demon out of a person who could not speak. Because they believed that you had to identify the demon. And if you couldn't speak, then you couldn't do it. Well, listen, Jesus cares about him. But here's the real heart of this passage. And I want you to notice in verse 35 what we just read. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You see, all of these illustrations simply point to what? That everywhere Jesus went, he saw the crowds, the multitudes of people. He saw them in all of their suffering and his heart broke for them and he wanted to reach out and minister to them with great compassion. Listen, don't you think his followers need to be doing the same thing? We who profess to follow Jesus should have that same heart of compassion within us. 
We can go through the New Testament. We can consider uh, the lepers who were the untouchables of their day. How Jesus not only would heal them, but he would touch them. He would reach out to them. He did what no one else would ever do with those people. Why? Because he loved them and he cared about them. We see the widow of Nain who's on her way to bury her son. And Jesus stops the funeral procession as they're climbing up this little mountain area to go up into one of the sepulchers that are on the side of the mountain. Jesus stops the procession and he heals and raises that young boy back to life again. All because of great compassion. There's so many people that are suffering today. We have people that are in bondage to sin, they're in bondage to sickness, they're in bondage to all kinds of things. We have people that are abused. We read reports about how children are abused, how wives are abused, how husbands are abused, how homes are falling apart. We read of terrible things that are going on inside of homes, terrible sins that are taking place. People are bound to that. They can't escape that kind of life. There are people who are forsaken. There are people who are in the grip of sickness and disease. They are in prison. They are broken. And what do they need? They all need the same thing. They need the compassion of Christ. They need Christ Jesus himself to reach out to them. But dear friends, he is not walking the streets of our city except through you and through me. You and I have to be the ones who go in his name and show this kind of compassion. You see, there are those who are suffering greatly today. Are you one of those? Are you suffering this morning? Are you going through some things in your own life, in your own uh, circumstances, where you don't think you can take another step, that you can do anything else? Dear friends, the Bible tells you and urges you that you're to cast everything on him. The Bible says, casting all our care on him, for he careth for us. 1 Peter 5, 7, what a tremendous verse that is. You see, there's a difference between the word cares that you cast on him and the caring that he shows to you. You see, the cares that we cast on him are are the anxieties and the worries and the fears and the doubts and all those things that frustrate us. And the caring of our dear Lord is simply this. He desires to be be involved in your lives. That he makes your concerns his priority. That's what the word really means. Your cares are his priority. He wants to minister to you. Listen, many of you come to church Sunday after Sunday and you're carrying great loads. You're going through things during the week. You are, you are, you are, you are having a tough time. You may have, have, have problems in your home. You may have problems on your job. You may be going through all kinds of things that you just don't think you can go another step. Well, the Bible tells us that we're to bear one another's burdens. We're to know about each other so intimately that we ought to be able to bear the burdens of other people. Dear friends, Jesus cares. He cares about you. He's compassionate towards your suffering. Early on, when there were poor and downtrodden people and people that were in great need, suffering great things, it was the people of God, it was the church that ministered to them. You can read history and you can see the church ministered to people. It was the churches who built hospitals. It was the churches who built things that would help alleviate the suffering of men. You say, well, pastor, I don't really think it's our job to take care of the suffering of men. Well, you think wrong then. Our Savior did that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when the people of God, when the Jews were sent into captivity, one of the things that the Lord told them to do while they were in captivity is to seek the peace of the city where they'd been carried. For in its peace, they would find their peace. In other words, what is he saying? Don't go into exile and captivity resisting it and saying, you know what, I'm not going to listen to these guys. I'm not going to pay attention to them. I don't really care what happens to them. No, God says, make sure that you minister to their needs as well. Seek their peace. 
Dear friends, we're here to seek the peace of people. There are people that are struggling all the time and they're suffering and they need to cast their cares on him. But how are they going to know that? How are they going to know that they need to do that unless we tell them, unless we point them to the one who has compassion for them? I want you to consider something else about his compassion. Not only did he have compassion for the suffering, but he had compassion for the scattered. If you'll look with me in verse 36, and he says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. This word for scattered means one who has been pushed aside or cast out. They're not just scattered because uh, they're all running across the field and having a race. They're scattered because they have no, no shepherd. They have no guidance. They have no direction in their life. You see, it's kind of like at the end of the book of, of um, Judges, where you find that one of the telling verses there simply says something like this. The people did what was right in their own eyes. They had no king. They had no direction. They had no spiritual leadership. They had no one to say, hey, this is the way, walk in it. And they did whatever they felt like doing. Well, we're living in a land like that, are we not? We're living in a culture like that, where everybody seems to do what they want to do. That sometimes when you hear about something terrible happening on the news and you say, how can people be like that? Well, they're depraved. They've been that way ever since they fell in the garden. But we're seeing it more and more. And what I've begun to notice over the last 20 years or so is that, is that fewer and fewer of those who profess to know Christ are really out there pointing the way to him. They're sitting in church buildings. They're sitting in church buildings talking about how bad the world is. And how dangerous it is out there and how we just need to stay away and protect ourselves and protect our families, protect our children, protect everything from the world. My friend Jesus said, go into all the world. Go into all the world. You see, he has compassion for those who are scattered, the poor, the orphan, the widows. You think of a man by the name of Zacchaeus who went to see Jesus in Jericho because of the crowd. He couldn't get through the crowd, and he was small of stature. And we know the story how he ran down the street and climbed up in that sycamore tree just so he could see Jesus. He had no intention of really talking to Jesus, any hope of even really communicating to Jesus. just wanted to see him. But what Zacchaeus didn't know is that Jesus had come to Jericho to see him. The Son of Man hath come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came looking for Zacchaeus. He had met Bartimaeus on the other entrance of the city. Blind Bartimaeus. And he had, and he had healed the him. Listen, Jesus came looking for the scattered. The Samaritan woman at the well where the Bible tells us in John 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. No self-respecting Jew must needs go through Samaria. You always find a way around it. But Jesus had an appointment there with a woman at a well. A scattered person having no direction. You think of the woman who was caught in adultery in John chapter 8 and being brought to Jesus and thrown at his feet. And what does Jesus do? He says, where are your accusers? They'd all left, had they not? And Jesus told her, go and sin no more. He forgave her of her sins. Listen, there are people that are scattered. Look, if you would, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. Matthew chapter 14. And notice what it says in verse 14 of Matthew, the 14th chapter. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Listen, when Jesus would see the great multitudes, he didn't just feel sorry, but he was moved with compassion to do something for them. You see, it's one thing if we drive down our streets and we see 
homeless people or we see people that are obviously in great need and it's it's one thing to go by and say oh my how do people get like this boy what a sad situation that is man oh man oh man somebody needs to do something about that it's one thing to see it and to feel bad about it but it's another thing to be moved with compassion and stop your car and get out of your car and say is there something I can do for you You see, when we hear a friend of ours that is discouraged or they're, they're going through a rough trial and they come and they're, they're just wanting to share their heart with anybody who will listen, many times we just simply say, oh no, here comes so and so again. All they want to do is talk about their problems. Oh, will you not have compassion on them? Jesus had compassion and was scattered of these scattered people. And what did he do? He saw they were sick and he healed them. He healed them. He touched them. Look, if you would, another passage in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. In Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And these are like both sides of the same time and same place because Jesus is also going to feed these 5,000 people plus that have come. But notice in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34 what it says, and Jesus when he came out saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd and he began to what? To teach them many things. You see not only do you take care of the immediate physical needs but you prepare them with the teaching of God's word. You see, it's one thing for us to support a mission like Emmanuel Baptist Rescue Mission and send our money and take supplies there occasionally and do those kinds of things and say, boy, it's good. We're cleaning those guys up and we're giving them some money and we're, we're making sure they can eat. But what if we were to go down there and, and give a large check? And I, I hope that we would do that one day. But we take a large check down there and we would simply say to those who are leading that ministry, we say, hey, listen. We want to give you this money, make sure the guys are fed, make sure they have clothes, make sure they have whatever they need. But really, let's knock off these services because obviously you're kind of forcing them to be here. They really don't want to be here. Why don't you just feed them? And and if they want to hear the gospel, they'll ask you about it. Well, that would be entirely wrong and there'd be no point in having a mission anymore, would there? Listen, you take care of the immediate physical needs, but the real need of every man and woman's heart is what? The gospel of Christ. They need to be taught. They need to be instructed. Jesus said, go you therefore and what? Teach all nations. I think that's a very interesting thing. Preachers always try to change that and say it's preaching and proclaiming. Well, it's teaching all nations who Jesus is, why he came, when he's coming again. Listen, Jesus went and had great compassion for the scattered. He sought them out. People are scattered and they're cast out and they need to know the truth. They need to know what really matters. They need to know that God really does love them. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Are you scattered? I'm not saying are you scattered brained. I'm saying are you scattered this morning? Have you been pushed out? Do you feel that you are not accepted anywhere? Do you feel that you're not really cared for? You're not loved? The psalmist David could write these words, no man cared for my soul. And many times we may feel like that. There are some times when I have conversations with those people that profess to be Christians and I will talk about something that that I'm excited about and they will look at me as if I'm from an outer space planet somewhere and they'll say, why would you mention that? And I began to realize, listen, I don't speak the same language anymore that, that, that many people do. I have no interest really anymore in worldly things. I don't really care. And so if all I got to do all the time would be to preach the gospel, sing praises to God, and, and tell people about Jesus, I would be happy. I, I would not desire anything else except occasionally to eat something. 
But I want to point out to you this morning that Jesus came looking for people scattered. Why? Because they had no direction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Death. It seems right. I'm always amazed, and I've stopped arguing about it. I've, I haven't really argued about this, but I've stopped even really making too many comments. I have someone the other day that told me, they said, well, now that we have this new president and everything's going to be wonderful again. And I said, has it ever been wonderful? What do you mean it's wonderful again? It's almost like when people say, well, America needs to get back to God. Well, when were we to God? We act as if there was an America way, 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 way back then where everybody prayed and everybody read the Bible and everybody talked about Jesus. And yet we find just prior to the first great awakening that the 13 colonies were filled with, with, with drunkenness and rapes were on the increase and murders were on the well, Listen, when were we to God? We've always been ordinary people in need of God. We've always needed a Savior. But Jesus has compassion. And if we're scattered, if you're scattered today, we need to come to him, don't we? Come to him. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest, not make your life more miserable. Not add a bunch of stuff to your busy schedule. I will give you rest. You won't be scattered anymore. You'll have a direction. Your heart will be right. That's what he wants for us to come to him. But thirdly, I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 9, not only... Was Jesus compassionate towards the suffering and the scattered? But if you'll look with me in verse 37, and notice that he was also compassionate for the sinner. Notice in verse 37, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look down in verse 1 of chapter 10. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Drop down to verse 5 of that same chapter. And notice it says, These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but go rather to the law lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely. You have received freely. Give. We can't forget our Savior's great compassion for the sinner. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are in this place this morning and you came to Christ because someone came to you and gave you the gospel. How many of you are here this morning because someone reached out to you and gave you the gospel? Lift your hand. All right. Very good. Someone came to you. You know, in all my years of being alive and going different places, no one has ever approached me to give me the gospel. I'm glad God had mercy and saved me anyway. How many of you are, that are here this morning, you came to Christ because you were invited to come to a church service by a friend? Lift your hand. That's how you came. All right. All right. How many of you came to Christ because you were raised in a Christian home and you grew up hearing the gospel? Lift your hand. All right. See, we have representatives of all types. But the main thing is that you and me, we were reached with the gospel. We were reached with the gospel. Why? Because the heart of our Savior beats for the lost. He desires to see people saved. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to rescue and to redeem those out of the grip of sin. Look, if you would, to the book of Romans for a moment. Romans chapter 5. 
Romans, the fifth chapter. And notice what he says here in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. He says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Listen, you and I could not save ourselves. Someone came to you and gave you the gospel, some of you, but you couldn't save yourself. Some of you were invited and you heard a gospel message and you came to know Jesus Christ, but you couldn't save yourself. Some of you grow, have grown up in a Christian home and you are saved by the grace and mercy of God alone because you couldn't save yourself. Your family couldn't save you. Dear friend, it was God and God alone who, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were helpless, he came and he lifted us up to himself. And Jesus sends his disciples and says, I want you to go. And I want you to proclaim. And I want you to go everywhere with this message of the kingdom. What else he told them? He told them to pray for laborers to go into the harvest. Pray for laborers to go into the harvest. And then he sends them out. Maybe you notice, isn't that interesting? Here they're saying, well, we're just going to have a prayer meeting. Let's pray for the laborers to go out in the harvest. Oh, no. He sends them. Dear friend, you and I are to pray for laborers to go in the harvest, are we not? What is the harvest? It is that it is that harvest of souls yet to come into the kingdom of God. We don't know how many there are. The Bible tells us that it's an, it is an innumerable company of people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. We don't know how many are out there, but we are called to pray for the Lord to send laborers. Well, when you have, you have a farm, you have, you're looking for laborers to go out in the fields and work hard and work early and work late and make sure the job is done. And we could see that in this word laborer, but also this word labor is an interesting word that also has a meaning of being a teacher. He is saying, go out. I'm looking for people who will go out and communicate the gospel of Christ. My dear friends, it wasn't just for the disciples to pray for someone to go, because that's what many Christians today do. Oh, we need to pray that God will raise up missionaries and send them out. Well, how about you going, oh no, I, I have a job, I, I have a family, I have plans that I need to take care of. Listen, we pray, but we also go. We also go. Listen, we go to everyone, don't we? I don't know who God is going to save. I don't know who his elect are. And it doesn't really matter that I know about any of that stuff. What matters is that I go with the message of the gospel of Christ that whosoever will call the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what I'm going with. That's what you should be going with. There are people that are suffering. There are people that are scattered. There are people that are bound in their sin. And only Jesus Christ has the answer. And we're his people. How we live our lives should reflect the heart of our Savior. He wants us to go everywhere with, with the gospel. Telling men and women, boys and girls, what Jesus has done for each one of us. You say, well, Pastor Miller, I'm glad that you've got that down. Now get out there and do it. I'll do what I can, but I need you to do what you must. Consider this. 
There are just a little over 7 billion people in the world today. 360,000 people are born every day. That's one person every 4.1 seconds. 151,000 people die every day. That's one every two seconds. Do you ever wonder how many of those people, when they're born, will ever know the gospel? And how many of those people who died will ever come to Christ? You know, every time that I hear that someone has died, I think of sometimes celebrities and you hear so-and-so died. The only thing that I think is what was said of the rich man, and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torment. See, I'm not one that goes around saying, well, maybe in, you know, even though they lived an unregenerate lifestyle, even though they lived a life that was, that was wicked, that maybe, maybe when they were unconscious, that maybe in the last seconds of their life, that God spoke to their heart and saved them. See, I don't, I don't get into that kind of stuff. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've been by the bedside of many people that are going to die and, and have died. And I have shared the gospel. And some of those people have come to know Jesus Christ. But some have not. I want you to think for a moment about your mother, your father, your daughter, your son, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your friends, your aunt, your uncle, your grandfather. And I want you to think with me this morning, do they know Christ? And if they do not know Christ, then when will they die? When will they leave this life? And then tell me you have plenty of time. No, you don't. Well, but Pastor Miller, we know that God will save his elect. Yes, we do know that, but we don't know who they are. And we're commanded to go everywhere with the gospel. Everywhere, to everyone. And let's be honest. It's been a long time since some of you have ever have shared the gospel with anybody. And let's be even more honest. It's been forever since any of you have ever shared the gospel with anyone. Who do you think will tell them? Oh, I'm not saying let's get in an argument with people. See, people always want to say, well, Pastor, you know, you know what, what should I say to a person who's like an atheist? How can I argue with them? God did not call you to argue with atheists. Then you become as prideful as they are. God called you to share the gospel. The same gospel you would share with an atheist. You would share with a homeless guy on the streets. The same gospel. Well, how do I talk to a Jehovah's Witness? The same way you talk to anybody. Listen, don't begin to think that simply sharing the gospel is you sharpening up your argument so you can win an argument. You may win the argument and the soul is lost anyway. What we need to point them to is the compassionate Savior who cares for them more than we care for them. What will we do? What can we do? Well, we can go out in the fields that are white unto harvest. We can be a laborer. We can get out of the barn and go to the field. We can pr proclaim that there's a compassionate Savior. It's interesting that if you look back at the history of Christians and the emphasis that they would make, there was a time when it was an intellectual approach 
to sharing with those who were intellectual and educated. And so we find that the, when the Puritans were building all of the great colleges and schools, Harvard and Princeton and Yale, that they, that they built those colleges for the purpose of educating people to go to speak to educated people about Christ. And they were able to reach some. But Jonathan Edwards, the most educated man in America at that time, probably the greatest thinker that America has ever had, got to the very basics of what? You're a sinner and you're in the hands of an angry God and you must repent. And boom, the awakening began. Puritans emphasize the, the wrath of God, and I think we ought to talk about the wrath of God, but not to the exclusion of the love of God. Amen. Dwight L. Moody, when he came on the scene with a fifth grade education, and that all he knew about was the love of God, so every sermon he preached was the love of God. Never talked about the wrath of God. So we ought to talk about the love of God without excluding the wrath of God. But dear friend, what the world needs to see It's a compassionate Christ who cares about them. Aren't you glad he cares for you? Oh, listen, he cares. He loves you with an everlasting love. But I want you to understand, time will run out. And there will be those that leave this life only to face a wrathful God. That's why Paul could write, behold, now is the time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's stand together as we pray.